looking and looking. When you're looking, you're looking to lust after, which leads to transgression. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the Bible says, All that's in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, which not of the Father but of the world, but there's a lust of the eyes. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 23 that if thy eye be evil, then is a whole body full of darkness. And the point is how we see affects our whole self. So we have to be careful about how we see or how we look at things. Uh -huh. Over in 2 Samuel, a very familiar, familiar story 2 Samuel chapter 11 about David, how he messed himself up with a woman named Bathsheba and brought upon himself and his family uh, some severe consequences. Anyway, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse number 2, David saw this woman from a rooftop. He saw her washing herself. And you know, you don't wash yourself with all your clothes on if you have on, any on at all. And she was very beautiful to look upon. And then so he inquired about the woman. They said, uh, this is by she, but she's the wife of another man, uh, Uriah. So David still, he sent for her and, and brought her to, to, to himself where he uh, committed adultery. He slept with the woman. And also he impregnated the woman in verse number five. And at the end of the chapter, she had a baby by David. Now, what I do know, I know that David, that maybe initially that he looked at the woman right. Because you can't help what you see. I mean, we can, we can see some things you can't help, but it's when you continue to look or you look in a lustful way, whether it's about money or possessions or like even in this story, looking at uh, the opposite sex in a lustful way that leads to transgression. And I know that he looked at her wrong because he transgressed. Now, if you notice over in Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, uh, the Ten Commandments under which David lived, the uh, Seventh Commandment in verse 14 says, Thou should not commit adultery. And David did. And I believe it because of his lust or because he violated the, the last of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Exodus 20, verse number 17. We said, thou should not cover thy neighbor's anything. Don't cover, don't cover your neighbor's house. Don't cover your neighbor's wife. And David, he did, which led to adultery. He did not look at the woman right. At first he did, but later on he looked at the woman wrong, which led to the transgression. Now, covetousness, according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, is idolatry. Look at the end of that verse. It's idolatry. It's anytime you put anything or anyone above God and his will, that's idolatry. And David did so because he put the woman ahead of God's will and transgressed with the woman. Also, that covetousness is also lust. Uh -huh. And that lust or that covetousness led to the transgression. And so you wanna, we want to transform ourselves into the will of God. We want to be like Christ. Well, hey, there's, there's a way that we look at things one way, the lustful way. We should not look at anything that way. Because if we do so, it could lead to some consequences. Because you cannot unsee what you already saw. Now, look, look over in Romans, Romans chapter 7. I want you to notice that, that lust and covetousness are one and the same. In Romans chapter seven, and verse number seven, Paul said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. He's talking about the old law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shall not covet, which was the 10 commandments. Now a little side point here, is there are folk today who believe that they are under the Ten Commandments, and but the uh, rest of the, the old law, Moses' law, had been done away with. And all the law had been done away with in Ephesians 2, verse 15, had been abolished in Christ's flesh. Colossians 2, 14, had been nailed to the cross. Uh, we still have it to learn from, Romans 15, verse 4, but we're not obligated 
uh, by those uh, precepts anymore. We're obligated by the New Testament. But anyway, my point is in this verse, you can see that uh, lust and covetousness are synonymous. They one and the same was led to his transgression because how he looked. Now, there are stages of how we look, right? You remember in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, Matthew 5, verse 28, Jesus says, Whosoever looking on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery in her heart. Now, whether it was a, if it was a naked person ran up the street, we can all look at that person and see a naked person run up the street without transgression, without lusting after that person. But there is, or can be, not necessarily that there has to be, there could be a point where we do transgress and begin to lust after that person, see? And so there's a stage of it, and now which leads to the very act. Over in James, James chapter 1 and verse 13, James 1, verse 13 to 15, where James said, Let not a man say when he is tempted, he is tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and when lust had conceived, it bringing forth sin, and when sin is finished, it bringing forth death. There is an enticement point of looking. We can see someone. Maybe like his money, maybe, like I said, his possessions or something contrary to God's will. We can see that and we can just notice it. Or like a naked person. That person doesn't have any clothes on. But there's another, there's a point that it could be I'm looking at that person to go against God's will lustfully to violate his will. See, the devil does this like that. Now, there's also uh, the, the point of transgression. It said, because when lust had conceived, it bringing forth sin, which in other words, transgression. First John 3, verse 4, sin is transgression of God's law. And then it brings forth death when it's finished, which is spiritual death. Revelation 20, verse 14, uh, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In other words, it leads you to hell. So when we're trying to be transformed. We want to make sure that we go to heaven. And that we are consistent with God's will. That we recognize this. I can see something in, in more without sinning. But there's a stage of it when I can watch it. And there's another stage which we should uh, refrain from it. Right? Now, let me just say this. Um, temptation is not sin. I said it. Temptation is not sin. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, Jesus was tempted and had no sin. Hebrews 4, verse 15, we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Uh-huh. Now, we all are tempted the same three ways. 1 Corinthians 10, and verse 13, the brother Robert Dawson alluded to. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, there is no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. All folk are tempted in the same three ways, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? Now, but God helps us also not to sin. Also in that verse, it says, but he will with the temptation. Also, uh, where he says, with the temptation will not suffer us uh, to, to, how's it go? Suffer us to, to be tempted above that which we are able and he also makes a way to escape. So God tries to help us. You can't say that I'm tempted to do wrong above what I'm able to, to, to bear up under because God didn't allow that to happen. And he makes a way to escape if we're looking for it. So God doesn't want us to, to be, when we're tempted, because all folk are tempted, he doesn't want us to give in to the temptation. Now, so there is God trying to help us. And there is also God gives us help. And this is the folk, there are some folk that want to go to heaven but don't want the help. Mm-hmm. See, you cannot, we cannot, we're in the world. And we can't leave the world. And we can't, we don't have the authority to make other folk dress right or do right. There are some things we're going to see, and we can still keep ourselves from sin. Uh-huh. So when you go to the mall, Go to the movies, 
You see stuff in the movies, see stuff at the mall, at the park, at the beach, or watching TV. And there's just some folk who just, uh, they just don't live right. It shouldn't be true of Christian folk. It's over in 2 Peter 2, verse 14. 2 Peter 2, verse 14. Some have eyes of adultery, which cannot cease from sin. But they got a heart, and that verse have a heart they've exercised or practiced after covetous, covetousness. See, that they lustful, a heart that they lustfully, you know, lustfully practice to do wrong. It's kind of like, you know, like a brother, all you do every commercial come on, you're trying to watch the, this immoral woman on TV or something, giving herself over to pornography or stuff like that. Well, Christians are supposed to refrain from that. When we recognize by God's word what's wrong, we refrain from it. And that's how God keeps us. He keeps us through his word. Now, maybe some, uh, maybe some guys that have an issue with it, one, one thing you could do, you get you a wife, and she could help you. If you got a problem with your eyes, well then you go out to the mall or to the park and you look lustfully at a woman and then pie yo, right upside your head. <laughs> what you looking at? <laughs> uh, that'll help. But we shouldn't need that. We have God's word, right? In Job 31 verse 1, Job said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why should I think on a maid? And that covenant between God and his word. That's what you see in Matthew chapter 4 and also Luke chapter 4 when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Remember, tempted with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he said, it is written, it is written again, it is written. The word of God can keep us because when we see that we're going beyond what God said, that stops us. I, can't, I can say, honey, that, this woman, she's not dressed right and I got to change. I can't keep watching. Also, Psalm 119 verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Hello, somebody. Okay, number two, because number one, you cannot unsee what you lustfully saw. So you don't want to see, some, see anything lustfully that's going to go beyond God's will. Number two, you cannot unhear what you've already heard. You know, uh, sometimes you can't help what you hear, but oftentimes we can. We just don't. We become desensitized by our society. And so, you know, you go to the movies and you know they got cursing all in the movie and you stay there anyway and even try to rationale, well, it's not as bad as some others. It's not that much cursing. It's not that much lewdness and immodesty. So you sit there and watch it anyway, even watching with the kids. When you ought to get up and walk out, get your money back. If they don't give you your money back, we're still not gonna watch it. Hello, somebody. Uh -huh. And I understand that I'm not preaching to you about something that we don't do. I've lost money stepping out of a movie, call that cursing and all that junk. You know, what we hear affects us. In Mark chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said, take heed to what you hear. Luke 8, in verse 18, he said, take heed to how you hear. And Luke 9, verse 44, he said, let these sayings sink down into your ears. And I know in that verse he's speaking about the, his upcoming crucifixion, but still it would be true of whatever God said we ought to let sink down into our ears. You look over in Luke chapter 11 and verse 27 and 28. Luke 11, 27 and 28. But this woman said to Jesus, she says, blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. And he said, but yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. When we hear things, we ought to make sure it's according to God's will. And if it's not, we ought to discard that, reject that, refuse that. Come on, am I right about it? That's right. You know, over in Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 13, verse 12 and 13. Genesis 13, verse 12 and 13, it was Lot. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. The Bible said, but the men of Sodom were, were wicked and sinners exceedingly. And so Lot, he took his family and went to Sodom. And if he didn't know they were wicked before he got there, he certainly knew after he got there. And he stayed anyhow. Look, over, look with me over in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 2, because it does matter where we live and what we listen to. 
In 2 Peter chapter 2, what's what the Bible says, starting at verse number 6. It says how God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and he delivered just Lot, righteous Lot. He was a righteous man. He said, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He was vexed or he was distressed. He was tormented with the you know, King James Version, which I use. I use the King James Version. This is the version that Moses gave me uh, when I went to Mount Sinai. He, he, he said, here you go, Richard. I said, thank you, Moses. <laughs> but anyway. So it's a conversation. Conversation means your conduct or your behavior, your manner of life. So he was tormented by the filthy deeds, wicked deeds. And it said, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, not just what you see, but also what you hear, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with unlawful, unlawful deeds. And so it Every day he saw and he heard this wickedness, and it affected him and his family. It messed him and his family up. Look with me over in Genesis, Genesis chapter 19. You remember in Genesis 19, verse 1, when the two men who were angels came to Sodom, and they came to Lot's house. They were in Lot's house, and they told him in verse 13, they told him that we're going to destroy this place, for the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So he told his two son-in-laws in verse 14, and the Bible said they were as ones that mocked. They said, you, you got to be joking. You, you got to be kidding. Kind of like when we tell folk about, hey, you ought to get your life right, because guess what? Uh, you die in your sins, you'll get up in your sins. And they, like, you still believe that stuff? Yeah, I believe that. You know, God's word, it came with evidence. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, it came not only in word only, but also with power. Uh -huh, miraculously, uh, miraculously given. Am I right? Supernaturally, so we know it came from God. But anyway, so he told his son-in-laws, and, and no, we're not leaving. And then the next morning, when they're supposed to, to hasten to get out, in verse 16, the Bible said the whole family lingered. They hesitated. You would have thought they'd be running up out of that wicked city. So the angels, God being merciful unto them, the angels took the hands of all of them and brought them out of the city. Then the angels said in verse 17, escape for thy life, but look not, by, look not behind thee. But in verse 26, Lot's wife looked back. Don't look back, but she looked back. You know, Jesus said in Luke 17, verse 32, to remember Lot's wife. Because I believe she had a dual allegiance. Oh, she was in that city. She came out, but she still loved it. Got some folk like that today, even in Christ. They, they're not going on to transformation. They're kind of in a holding pattern in their Christianity. You know, come on, somebody. That's right. One reason why, because you're still, you're still watching. Some still watching and listening to that same junk, that same sinful stuff that you did when you was, before you obeyed the gospel. Jesus said in Luke 9, verse 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So anyway, so Lot's wife, Mrs. Lot, she's lost. And then in verse 31, Lot comes out with the two daughters. In verse 31, the firstborn, she says, unto the younger, uh, younger daughter, our father is old and there is no man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that he may preserve seed of our father, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made the father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she arose, nor uh, when she laid down, nor when she arose. And then the next night, the younger daughter did it. I don't know how you make folk drink wine. Yeah, you know I mean, Lot was a righteous man, but here he allows himself to get so drunk he didn't even know he slept with his daughter and did it again. And even how the city must have affected their thinking, even so much that you want to do something like that. And one of the saddest verses in the Bible is verse number 30, when it says, Thus were both the daughters of Lot 
with child by the father. Oh, so sad. In next two verses, they had a had babies by their dad. But see, but it, it messed the family up, didn't it? Righteous, righteous father, head of the household. But what they saw and what they heard every day destroyed the whole family. You know, it don't take a whole lot. You know, just a little bit, a little bit every day. You get used to doing a little bit every day. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6 says, a little leaven, leaven the whole lump. A little wickedness, it'll mess, mess all the good up. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners every single time. There's no way you can listen to a whole bunch of file stuff, watch it and listen to it, and you're going to be holy and godly. That's not going to happen. Come on, somebody. What you put in is what's going to come out. Uh, amen, somebody. Okay, next. And guess what? By the way, nobody told me how much time I have, and I didn't ask. <laughs> yeah, see, Mark, we pulling me. Uh, you cannot unspeak what you already said. Number three, you cannot unspeak what you already said. Uh, look at uh, Judges, Judges chapter 11. In Judges chapter 11, you remember Jephthah. Jephthah made a vow to God in, Je in uh, Judges chapter 11, in verse number 30, he vowed to the Lord that if you will uh, deliver the Ammonites into my hand, he says in verse number 31, and when I return back from the battle, he said the, the, uh, uh, the first... Uh, whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace uh, from this battle shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now, the first, the first something that came out of his house when he came back was his daughter in verse number 34. She came and she was his only child and beside her he didn't have any other children. And there's many who believe that Jephthah that he offered his daughter as a burnt offering. But I don't believe that because what he said was he's going to offer it as a burnt offering and God is the one who, de who determined the parameters of a burnt offering. He's the one to give the definition of a burnt offering. You couldn't offer anything. You couldn't offer a snake or a rat or a pig or fish or people. You look over Leviticus chapter 1 and Leviticus chapter 6. There are only five things you could offer. And I believe Robert Dawson taught this in school too, by the way, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the offerings. You could offer a bull out of the cattle. You could offer sheep. You could offer a goat. You could offer a dove or a pigeon, depending on your economic status. But you can offer anything. And I have also, you might want to look at, I uh, put down the last two verses of Deuteronomy 12. Because God didn't want you to do like the heathen and sacrifice your children in the fire like they did. But anyway, uh, but I believe so in verse number 34, now verse number 39 that, that he, because he says, look at verse 31 first. Verse 31 he says, this is what he could do. He says, shall surely be the Lord's. So I believe what he did, he gave his, his daughter to the Lord uh, as, as a virgin. In verse number 39, kind of like what Hannah did in 1 Samuel chapter 1 when she gave uh, Samuel her child after he was weaned to Eli the priest. Now, but anyway, my whole point about this is this. It's verse number 35, the end of verse number 35. And we, can and we can dispute or debate the rest some other time, guys. But in verse number 35, he said this, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. I made a vow to God, I cannot go back. I cannot unspeak what I vow to the Lord. Come on. You know, when we become New Testament Christians, you took a vow of commitment to God, every Christian. And you can't take that back, by the way. When you were baptized for mission of your sins, you acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ. We're all supposed to be disciples. In Acts 11 and verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. If you are a Christian, you're supposed to be a disciple. And a disciple follows the teaching and the example of another. Jesus said in John 8 verse 31, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. 
In Luke 6, verse 40, he said the disciple not above his master, that, that he to be perfect shall be as his master. And every Christian ought to do that. You made that vow. We also make vows in marriage. I'm telling you, folk are just uh, vow breakers, covenant breakers today. But Christians should not be. When you get married, it's a three-way relationship between the two of you and the Lord. Because God is the one who joins in marriage. Matthew 19 and verse 6. Am I right about it? That's right. And we take those vows for better, for worse, ritual, for poor, sickness, sin, and health, to honor, love, honor, and cherish, to death do us part. And we ought to honor that. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 5 says, it's better for you not to make a vow to God than to make it not to pay. I think the next verse says, don't, don't allow your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Right? Keep it. Come parents, man. We make vows to our children. We ought to do our best to raise them the way God said, in the ways of the Lord. Am I right? Like, like God said about Abraham in Genesis 18, verse 19. I know Abraham that he will uh, command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord. We ought to all do that. Or even uh, in, in society, when you go and you get a job and we vow to go to work and do the job, but then we ought to keep our word and do that, do the best we can. Because we are an example to the Lord, for the Lord, am I right? And also, by the way, I can say also in our daily conversation, too. Our daily conversation, watch what we say. Because some things that we say and how we talk to folk, you can't take it back. Or maybe you can apologize for it, but you know how words, words are like stones. Uh -huh. you, you can say some things that are so hurtful, so callous, so malicious. And yeah, and guess what? It changes our relationship. And Christians ought to also speak the way the Bible authorizes. First Peter 4, verse 11, if any man speak, then speak as the oracles of God. Well, this is what the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 29, and let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to you say edify to me, minister grace unto the hearers. And remember what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37, that every idle word, every worthless word that a man should speak, he shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. Oh, we may be forgiven, guess what, but it may be consequence of what we say. Am I time up? Okay. When they come sit down in the front, sometimes it's a signal. <laughs> Buddy, okay. Hey, just let me know. I'll stop. You know, we preachers, man, we always have more than we have time for. Am I right? And the day is no exception. Okay, I just move on. Uh, number four, you cannot undo what you've already done. You cannot undo what you've already done, so we ought to be careful what we do. Be careful, little hands, what you do. You remember how Judas was a thief and a hypocrite. In John chapter 12 and verse number six, how he kept the money back because he was a, okay, because he was a, a thief. Well, also a hypocrite because he betrayed the Lord with a kiss, a kiss of love, a kiss of friendship, and that was a signal of betrayal. In Matthew 27, look at Matthew 27, Matthew 27, Matthew 27, and verse number three, here's Judas. He said, then Judas, when he had betrayed, which had betrayed him, when he saw he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the, the uh, 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed innocent blood. He had, he exercised every aspect of, of repentance or every aspect uh, to obtain God's forgiveness. Because one, he repented himself, he had a change of mind, resulted in a change of life. Hey, verse number four, he acknowledged his sin. Like 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he said, I have sinned. He also exercised restitution. He brought the money back. You got Christians who have an opportunity to do that and don't do it. See, folks, they forsake the assembly. Come next week and, and, and only bring the offering for that week. What about the week before that? Uh -huh, you ought to bring that offering too. That God bless you that week. As, as you, he made you to prosper, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. Am I right? And so really you sin twice. It's kind of like Jeremiah 2, verse 13. You committed two evils. Uh -huh. But here is Judas. He also exercised restitution. But you notice, that, you notice what the elders, they said. They said, 
What is that to us? See thou to it. And because he couldn't undo what he had done, he went back to his uh, former life, or maybe never left it. Maybe it wasn't true repentance after all. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, because godly sorrow will work repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but sorrow or sorrow of the world work at death. But you know, but here's the thing, you know, even if you may do something, we may do something, and we ought to be mindful of it because there's some things that we can do and we can't take it back, right? We have to live with the consequences. And Judas, he couldn't live with the consequences. I had uh, some more, but I've been told I have to stop. I, I just say, I got, I got a minute? Here's a minute. The last one would be, you cannot unthink what you already thought. Uh-huh. You know, guess what? You can't help sometimes what coming to your mind, but you can help meditating upon it or constantly contemplating it, right? If it's not right, try to get it out. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. You know, Jesus told the Jews in Matthew 9 verse 4, why think ye evil in your heart? You get thinking evil about folk, and guess what? And you can end up uh, acting upon it. In Proverbs 23, verse 7, so as a man thinking in the heart, so is he. I can think about killing you uh, every day, and I just may. Or vice versa, get killed. But the point is, is that we want to not think that way, but think right. Be careful about how we think. And you can put down James 4, verse 8, that we ought to think on the things that are lovely, pure, good report, praiseworthy. Am I right? Now, don't have your mind in the gut all the time. I remember an old deceased uh, Christian woman. She was the eldest wife. We were over the house. We used to go over there and, and, uh, and, and eat, my family. And so I was telling about a movie we had watched. And I thought it was a pretty good movie. And, and she just looked at me. She says, she said, why do you want to put that filth in your mind? And I didn't think it was filthy. I thought it was action-packing good. But when I told her about it, it's what she said. So maybe we might need to examine again that what we think on, what we look at, what we put in. And briefly, you cannot own things. You cannot see what you already saw. But be careful about how you see how you look at things. Don't do lustfully. You cannot hear what you already heard. So we'll think about what we hear and how we hear. You cannot unspeak what you already said. Be careful what we say, how we talk, and the vows we make. You cannot undo what you already done. We'll have to be careful how we treat folk and what we do, right? And you cannot unthink what you already thought. So when we can allow ourselves to think on some things, I ought to be thinking according to what God has said. Hey, and God bless you, and thank you.